Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to One Broken Mom. Wow. Um, This is June 3rd on a Wednesday. And uh, as I'm recording this episode with my guest, Dr. Laura Markham today, we are in the midst of um, historic, whatever you want to call it right now. Uh, We thought that 2020 was going to be defined by a worldwide pandemic. um, And then we have as a nation have another crisis on our hands, a crisis that didn't just happen, but as we all know, has been decades, if not generations in the making. Uh, coming to a boiling point where many of us are already in a heightened um, and aroused state of survival mode from stay-at-home orders, economic issues, unemployment. You know, many of us, all of us are all affected, you know, not just the United States, but worldwide. Um, When I reached out to Dr. Laura last time we had spoken, um, we have a very happy cover for the podcast. It's Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids. It's, um, you know, it was a great discussion on what kind of things that parents can do and how to um, how to bring, uh, again, a, a definitely a calmer way to parenting. And, uh, and it, was, it was lovely. I loved talking with you um, and with, uh, with Laura. And so when I asked her to come on a few months ago, it's actually been a couple of months ago. Again, I, like everybody else, thought the worst thing we were going to deal with this year was going to be this pandemic. And um, her, her presence today, I believe, is very timely um, and very important. I know that I am personally a triggered parent right now, and I am far from peaceful. Um, There's no peace outside my doorstep in my community. My community right now is struggling with um, dialogue around racism because we have very uh, uh, racist factions in our own community that have risen their ugly heads. And so we've got businesses, we've got people um, you know, inside my house, I'm triggered because I'm a you know person who's been healing from trauma. So all of this has become tr- triggering. It is a social media news. It doesn't matter where it is. There's nothing at peace around here. And on top of that, I'm a parent with two teenagers who are trying to sort their their world out. And so, like many of you, I know um, not all of you have kids, but some of you do. And so, I think our conversation is actually going to be very valuable. I hope it's valuable, um, and that was my intent. So, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for coming on the show today and having this conversation with me. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Um, So for everybody, um, you wrote a book called Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids. Um, Would you write a second edition to that right now based on (laughs) what's going on and what you're seeing and sensing and feeling right now? (laughs) You know, um, I think the lessons are still the same. The, you know, the, the big ideas in Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids are the first big idea is regulate your own self first. Regulate your own emotions, you know, do the self-care you need to do to stay centered so you can be emotionally generous and present, fully present with your kids. That's still lesson one. It's lesson one for all of us for most of our lives. It's the work of a lifetime. And now we're getting, you know, we must have done well on our previous coursework because we're getting thrown at us now as sort of graduate level work. This is, this is, I mean, I've said about the pandemic before we had the big blow up this week with demonstrations and police uh, overreactions, et cetera. We, just with the pandemic alone, it was like a crash course in handling negative emotions, fear, anxiety, anger, disappointment, uh, vulnerability. Uh, You know, there's so many things going on with us that we had to handle. And honestly, most of us did not grow up in households where our parents knew how to teach us emotional intelligence or how to handle big emotions in a healthy way. And most of us didn't learn it, right? So we're learning it now if we didn't learn it since then. Right. Now, have you been talking with parents and helping them figure out like, you know, regulation is easy to do when you're on kind of an even keel and then you get a spike from a bad job review or somebody says something or, you know, you have a fender bender or whatever it is. Right. And then you amp up or even a death in the family. I mean, let's go a little bit more severe, you know, death and and things like that. And then we're able to come back down. But 
when we are all really in a constant state of arousal, like our, that, that little bump, you know, is huge. Um, how, what would you say and what do you say now to people where your baseline is already at energetic and, and feeling very uncomfortable and then you have to regulate down because it, it seems like I know that I have some difficulty coming back down to my normal, like my no pandemic, no Black Lives Matter, no, you know, no other things going on baseline. I haven't even, I don't know that I've ever gotten down to that level yet in the last, I don't know, I've been social distancing since March, so three months now. Um, where I'm, I'm operating at like hover level above the ground. Um, so what are you asking or, or suggesting and in, in kind of counseling with people now to do in, in terms of getting it as close as you can? Well, you know, when you're a parent, you're always getting triggered by your children, right? It doesn't matter if they're toddlers or teens, you, you're getting triggered. So there is constant work. And on a daily basis, you basically have to clear that stuff out. I do it with meditation. Many people do it with exercise. There aren't too many other ways that research has proven you can do it. You do need to do that clearing. And sleep, of course, does some of it for all of us. But when you have the level of stimulation and negative emotion that we have right now, just with the pandemic, you have to actually proactively do it. You need to... So, you know, I, I talk to moms who say, I just found myself sobbing. I didn't know what else to do. It's like, of course you found yourself sobbing. If you didn't, you wouldn't be paying attention, right? So I think we just need to have that level of awareness that to nurture ourselves through a very difficult time, because if we don't, we can't show up for our kids and we can't be, uh, we can't even show up for ourselves, right? So, so when I say that, what I mean is, you need some practices that work. So meditation works if you just sit down and, and there are many kinds of meditation. It's very hard to get started if you're not already a meditator, in which case I recommend a guided meditation. There are many options online. Experiment till you find something that works for you. Even 15 minutes a day, you will change your brain wiring. You will calm yourself down. It, it really does work. Exercise, we know, works. Getting outside, we know, works. Journaling works. Journaling taps into what a psychologist would say, your observer self. Um, a more spiritual way to look at it is you're tapping into your higher wisdom. Regardless, if you're compassionately um, holding yourself emotionally, in a sense, and you allow yourself to write about whatever you're feeling. You'll be feeling those feelings. They come up, you hold yourself through it emotionally, they begin to dissipate because emotions are giving us an, a message, right? And it's feelings in the body. And as you allow them, as you admit them to consciousness, allow yourself to feel them, they do begin to dissipate. But the thing is, when you have so many big emotions getting triggered every single day, You've got to do these things every single day. You know, you can, you can talk to a friend and vent, but the problem with that is that often it becomes a game of ain't it awful, and that just makes you feel worse. The only way it works is if you're venting with someone who doesn't feel the need to fix you and allows you, and you feel safe enough, to get to sort of the deeper level of, of pain, not just anger, because of course, if you're paying attention, you're probably angry, right? Mm -hmm. But- but something deeper, the more vulnerable feelings of hopelessness that visit us all sometimes, or just the despair of how do we live in a democracy together and, and make decisions that are good for everybody and treat everybody fairly. I mean, these are big challenges that humans are trying to deal with, right? So I think there are a lot of vulnerable feelings. There's fear. If you're if you're going out to demonstrate, you probably feel some fear. If you're, if you're African-American and you're dealing with a police officer, you probably feel some fear. You know, there's a lot of, of um, emotions coming at us that we have to process, basically, is what I'm trying to say, no matter who you are and what you believe. Uh, so we need to do that. We need to just take responsibility to do that kind of clearing. It's like brushing your teeth. You do it every night from your day and you will sleep better and you will wake up better. And when you wake up, you can even shift yourself when you wake up. If you don't wake up in a good mood, you can 
do a little practice to get yourself into a better mood because no matter how bad things are, there are always things to be grateful for. And there's research showing that what you focus on is what you feel. So a thought that you focus on, every thought creates emotions, right? So whatever thoughts you're letting, imagine you're going through your day with a little bubble around you of all the thoughts you're thinking. And, you know, here's this thought of, oh no, that will never work. And here's this thought of, oh no, what if that happens? You know, can you imagine all those thoughts? Do you really want those thoughts creating your mood, right? So we can actually look at that and say, okay, I'm going to choose a better thought. We don't know yet. Like the pandemic, we don't know yet what's going to happen when parents say to me, but what if school is closed in September? And I say, that's a scary thought (laughs) for you right now. And we don't know yet. You don't have to fight that battle yet. Be here now. Be present right now. You can make it through today, one day at a time. You can, and so that's what you say to yourself, one day at a time. It's a time-honored saying for a reason. One day at a time, I can do this. I can handle this, right? And, and in, in, acknowledge all the feelings. You're not trying to say, oh, I don't feel that. Acknowledge all the feelings, let them in. But notice the thoughts that are getting you in trouble. Find thoughts like, I'm just so glad my family is healthy. I feel so blessed that I have my two children. I feel so grateful that I have work I love. You know, you can find things, even even when you've lost your job. I have enough to feed my children today. Whatever, you know, and I know it's facile for me to say that, right, if I still have a job. But I think how we see things will always determine our power because it determines our self-empowerment in a sense, right? And if we want to do something about the dismal state of affairs in which we find ourselves in the world today, then we need to start by getting ourselves in top fighting condition in a sense. Where, and when I say fighting, I, don't, I mean in the most positive sense there is, where we stand up for what we believe and we go out there and we make it happen. Mm-hmm. Those are, uh, those are great things. Um, I, and a lot of stuff was kind of running through my head and, you know, and one of them that it, you see kind of playing out right now in uh, social media, which is the, the shame that can come around for somebody who makes an active choice. I want to think positively. I want to see hopefulness. And the counter argument to that, you know, and it's not the, a true counter argument. It's just the argument somebody spits off of their tongue and, and directs it at somebody, which is you're ignoring the problem. It's almost as if there's so much of this black or white thinking that we see out there. And we don't mean that in terms of humans. I mean, that is in it's this or that. And um, that there's, there's um, the more amped and uh, the more triggered we become, the, the less nuanced our thinking ends up, you know, kind of evolving with that. And so when somebody is like, you know, I just want to see that, you know, what happened was that I saw all these good things happen. And then somebody looking at you going, you're blind, you're an idiot, you're an ignorant. Yeah. I mean, and all the shame words that come throwing out there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, I mean, I can just see, like, I can speak to my community here and I can just, and I know that this translates, I, I do know this translates that then you're challenged of like, well, how can I even look at the good side without that being a bad thing? Right. And, you know, and yes. as, in the, as a right. human, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so let me ask you, um, you have two teenagers. Yes. I'm sure there are times with your teenagers where they are in bad shape, where the, where the life does not go the way they want it to go. And it seems like the end of the world to them. And where you may even see, you know, yeah, this is a bad situation for you to be in. I get it. So how can you best be support? How can you best support your teenager at that moment? Do you do it by, I mean, they're in a dark place. Do you climb in that dark place with them or do you hold the light? You hold the light, right? You hold the light. And that doesn't mean you don't acknowledge that it is a really hard place to be, right? It, It means that you acknowledge it's a hard place to be and you're completely there to support them. And you hold the hope, you hold the light. Because right now they can't. Nothing wrong with them that they can't. Life just clobbered them. Of course they can't hold the light, right? That's the way it is. You know, there are plenty of times in my life where I couldn't hold the light either. That happens to all of us. And we hope for someone 
who has integrity and who has compassion to hold that light for us at those moments and to offer us a hand. When somebody holds out that hand to us, maybe we can take it and begin to empower ourselves forward, right? Mm -hmm. But, but it, it isn't, it is never going to help us, anyone who's in a dark place, to huddle there and grab and say, come on in. If you're not here, you're not seeing what's going on. Of course you're seeing what's going on, right? It, but you can, you can take responsibility to shift yourself to a place of more empowerment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, anger is a step above despair and empowerment, right? I mean, if you look at the continuum of places humans can be, despair is at the bottom because you give up, right? You give up. But if you start to get angry about something, you actually are beginning to move toward a place of more empowerment, right? Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to be responsible with your anger, but anger can be a really potent place to be if you're coming from despair, right? And then, you know, do I think that it would be great if we could all get from anger to love and peace? Absolutely, I do. And I think that's, unless you're, you know, Mother Teresa or Jesus, I think that's a, a, a or Buddha, you know, a tall order. Mm -hmm. um, do I think I would like to aspire to that? Of course. And I don't think that means that, Jesus or Mother Teresa or Buddha were blind to what was going on and to the pain surrounding them. I, and, you know, we could add to our list. I, those are the first three I thought of. But, but, but I, I don't think it means, um, I think wherever anybody is, is just fine for them to be. I don't think everybody has to be in the same place. And I think we all support each other to move toward fairness and justice because what other way is there for humans to live together? Mm-hmm. You, the the comment that you made there just that made me think about it because we are like I say we and I also my observation and today um, before this recording here I've, you know I've made a couple of social media posts um, one of them is the feeling that I've been having which is watching um, contrition with people we had an, an episode that happened in our town where um, a, a a hoax turned into an opportunity for white supremacist factions to infiltrate under the guise of protecting, you know, interests in a town. Um, business owners are in the crossfire of that because they, they didn't know that this was what was going on. And then there's pictures posted showing these white supremacists outside these businesses, protecting these businesses. And then of course, then um, all these businesses are then categorized as racist. And, and it's not true. Um, and then there is in the community uh, people that demand why the businesses didn't stop it when they saw it and didn't do anything about it. And, and you know, and there's a lot of Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking about what would you have done or what should you have done. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, watching armed men, you know, with assault rifles standing out there um, is frightening to anybody, to anybody. Yeah. Okay, so it's frightening. Um, so then I, when you talked about parenting, right, holding the light. The thing that came to my mind when you said that is if we do this sometimes, right? When we do these exercises as adults is we're struggling with our inner child, right? The, the thing that gets activated and the thing that's scared is, the, is this um, beautifully constructed nervous system that came together in childhood. Right? You guys are going to hear me repeat this on every episode I do because it's the important thing to carry away from all of this conversation. And when I talk with people, it is if you saw somebody talking to a kid the way you're talking to yourself, would that be allowed to you? Like you don't have to have a kid to sit there and observe in a park, a parent or an adult down talking to a child. And we talk about that in that therapeutic process. That's your voice. Maybe you're talking to yourself in. And if you understood that yourself is actually kind of in that regard, it helps that. I, I'm getting to my point here. It's like a long arc. I'm coming back in. <laughs> um, but I sit there and think like my perspective then with people in my community is if that was my child that had found themselves, if my child was a business owner and that had happened, and then my child is mortified, is contrite for what had happened, is feeling guilty that they didn't see it, didn't know what to do at that time. They're struggling to find out that answer. As a parent, you bet there'd be arms around them and compassion and trying to help them and show them. But we don't see that from a lot of other adults. Like we, and I've said this before, we judge adults by what they had to do to survive as kids 
And we think that there's a lot of choice in the matter of, of how we can react under stressful conditions and stressful situations. And I think that, like I said, the point where you're saying is holding a light. I love that. Like we, if we hold it for our children, we, we should or find, could find ways, should find ways, hopefully can find ways to hold light for our, for our neighbors, adults even, um, because somebody didn't hold a light for them. Right. right? Like, you know, or, uh, you know, and it doesn't cost anything to do that, right? To to hold that for some. I mean, <laughs> it, it 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 can cost us um, the feeling of that we all desperately want in challenging times, which is we want to be right. Yes, we want to right. We want to win. We want to be right. We want to prove we're right. We want to prove someone else is wrong, and sometimes we have to give that up to hold the light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I brought that up in the in the definition of bias of cognitive of uh, uh, confirmation bias. That sometimes part of what weighs into that is this is the fear that we have to give up our position that that we are correct and we don't take enough time to make decisions because thinking is hard, and the human brain can't process you know as fast as we'd love it to, and so it makes these shortcuts and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's great. Okay, so now we're we're talking about um, and I and I've talked with some other parents right now too, and asked them how much alone time are you getting, and they're like not very much. And to your you know, like you said, you have to make it intentional. Like before, when you could find it in and squeeze it in when you could to, it's almost as if at this time you can't even afford to do that. You have to be more vigilant about, you know, figuring out how to do this uh, ventilation or you discharge or whatever, um, you know, of these emotions. Processing. Yeah. in this processing of emotions. So I like, um, I like that. Um, if we get to now, you know, and that was part of this conversation, we're, we were regulating ourselves as adults and parents. Now we're getting ready to engage with our children here. Um, how do we model and guide some emotional development through this in a way that allows us to feel and, and feel our emotions and at the same time not overwhelm our children with our emotions. I mean, I, like, it, I feel like sometimes it, we are, I, I'm trying, like, I'm trying not to be activated around my kids. I want them to see that this is normal. And I feel like what I'm going through and what they're going through is a normal experience. But at the same time, I always concerned about how kids take everything personally and are, are concerned about that. So what have you been counseling with parents about this, about how to be authentic with feelings, but at the same time, not to the point of where it may be overwhelming for our kids to see us too authentic. I think you have to do your own work first, internally, right? I think if you're in tears after watching a video, you don't go immediately to your kids and say, oh my goodness, this terrible thing happened. That's using your kids to process, right? You're not doing that. You're taking care of you. You're taking that private time after they're asleep or before they get up in the morning or whatever, and you're doing your own processing as much as you can. And I do think when kids are, um, you know, anything over the age of six, they may, first of all, no child under the age of 10 should watch TV news ever, ever. You should never have TV news on around a child under the age of 10 because TV news is designed to be sensational. It's designed to to trigger people through fear to keep watching, right? And it's designed to, in a sense, to traumatize for that reason. So why would you have your have that around on around your child? You know, um, the news for the pandemic. Uh, I was so surprised where people were putting up Instagram, thing, you know, depictions of themselves doing whatever during the pandemic, and in the background, there's a TV going. And their children, they're doing things with their children. That was the point of the Instagram post. And in the background, there's the pandemic reporting going on. And the children, it's filtering in, even if they're three or four, they're hearing about people dying. Like, really? And if they're now, if the TV is on or even NPR and you've got, you know, the the constant refrain of, you know, and then the police station was up in flames and then this and then that. And, you know, like, I don't think we want our children to be exposed to that. It's totally fine to read the newspaper with a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old. That's different. It's not as visceral. So that's the first thing I'd say is you do your own work first. And the second thing I'd say is you do not expose kids to the same sources of news you're seeing. Um, Reading print 
in a publication that you feel good about is fine. But I, I, you know, I would be even careful of that. I wouldn't sit there and start reading aloud a story to your kids without having read it to yourself first, right? So mm-hmm. there's that. Um, and then I would say you do have to be aware that your kids, if they have any online contact with anyone, even if you're not letting them see the news, if the New York Times got delivered to your house, there's going to be a picture uh, on the front page, and they're going to go, "What's that picture? What's on fire?" Right? Or it, you know, if they're if they're eight or nine and they're playing some online game with a friend, they're gonna hear about this. So even younger children are hearing about things and I would bring it up. I would not let my child suffer in silence and wonder about it or think something's normal, right? Uh, I would definitely bring it up. And the first thing you wanna do is understand what your child has heard. I'm gonna give you an example. This was on my Facebook page yesterday. One mom, let her daughter watch her her son is three, I think, and her daughter's six. And she let her six-year-old daughter watch a video about Rosa Parks. Great idea. Three-year-old's watching too. The three-year-old had heard at preschool that when people are bad guys, they get arrested by the police. So when the when the police came on the bus to arrest Rosa Parks, there's, there's suddenly, a, the, the three-year-old's like, she's a bad guy. They better get her. And the mom tried to talk to him about it. And he said, she's bad. And the mom said, no, she wasn't allowed to sit there because she's African-American. And, and the kid goes, that makes her bad. Like he, he was somehow now equating, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's amazing what kids will do with the information they receive that can be completely off base, Right. So I think we have to understand what have they heard and how are they interpreting it? That's the first thing to do. Before you start lecturing your kids about anything or what's right and wrong, start with, what have you heard? And what do you think about that? Well, obviously she deserved to get arrested in this case, the, the little one, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so we want to find out, well, what did you think of that? That's the first question. And then we say, hmm, and always don't, never, um, when your child has a feeling about something, that's scary, you say. That, the, the kid says, that's scary. The police station was burning. That's really scary. You don't say, well, not as scary as someone getting choked to death. <laughs> what you say is, yes, that's scary. Having a, having a police station on fire is scary for everyone. Yeah. It, people had to be pretty mad to do something like that. What do you think about that? Do you think that was a, a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? Could you imagine getting so mad you might do something like that? What kind of thing might make you so mad? Right, so those are the the that's the way to have the discussion, and your child might need some facts, right, about that this is not the first time this has happened that a police officer has killed someone in their custody, for instance. Um, so, your child will need facts from you, and it's good to go into the discussion educated, but mm-hmm. basically you're listening, and you're validating your child's emotions. You're asking questions and you're helping them think critically about the situation. So you mentioned the blog post that I wrote yesterday. Um, you know, I have some questions there to ask kids, you know, that help them to, to, you know, draw the lines, the dot, you know, make the dot, the lines of the connections. Because I think most parents, these are not discussions our parents ever had with us. Not no. that these things weren't happening. These things were happening, but we didn't get we didn't we knew about it if we were african american we might have known about it if we were white but not mostly and so we it wasn't talked about by many families and so i think a lot of parents do are looking for guidance about how to talk to kids and and i would say this is the this is how you get started but it's an evolving conversation you don't have to know all the answers and you don't have to know you don't have to do everything in one conversation something as big as race you're going to talk about it on an ongoing basis your children's entire childhood. And in fact, since we know toddlers see race and they start to draw conclusions about race just as about everything else. You know, toddlers see gender. Oh, they get, they real, you know, they think, oh, boys are strong, girls are not. Why do they think that? Well, that's what the cartoon showed them, right? You know, what are, so what are, what conclusions are toddlers drawing if you stiffen up when you're, loading the car up and you've got the toddler in the cart from the supermarket and it's dark in the winter and somebody comes towards you and you stiffen up. And, you know, does that person's race 
does the toddler make the connection? Maybe if it happens often enough, absolutely. The toddler notices how that person looks and they notice how you're responding, right? So mm -hmm. we're teaching kids about race every single day. And we, and also media teaches kids about race every single day. So we want to be the most significant teachers in our child's life about anything that has to do with values and values has to do with how we believe people should be treated and valued. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's our job to actually talk explicitly on an ongoing basis. And a lot of parents don't know how to do that. And so maybe this is something that will get them started. Yeah, it, it, I agree. And I do want to actually talk a little bit about some of the things that you point out for the listeners. And then um, there will be a link to the article in my podcast notes so people can go in and, of course, get back to your website to see the other resources that you have. Um, but, you know, I guess one of the questions that families always have is what's how do you have a conversation given the different age groups because of the fact that, you know, sometimes adults talk to kids as if they can understand executive, you know, very, you know, adult concepts. And you know, your example is beautiful about even the difference between three and six. You know, there's a, there's a lot of abstract ideas in there that the kids just aren't there yet and can't get to it, but there's still a way to be able to address it. So um, what do you recommend for um, anybody that has, you know, again, let's say the toddler. So that would be like three and under, right? Yeah. Ish. Three and under, three and under, you're simply, um, admiring everybody. Yes, she has blonde hair. Yes, she has curly black hair. You know, you're admiring everybody. Um, it's great that people are different. That's such a great thing. It, the pe people being different makes the world a richer place. And you're talking about ideas of fairness, even though they don't quite get it. I mean, by the time they're six, fairness is everything. They're very rule bound in that way. <laughs> but, but when they're three, they're just starting to get it. But they get, I mean, they're not just starting to get it. They're just starting to express it. But we, we know actually that even before they can talk, babies have a concept of fairness. And there's a lot of research on that. You could Google and, and see how researchers have sorted this. But basically, babies are shown a video and they observe something where somebody's treated in a certain way as fair or not fair. And the babies respond by giving that person something or not based on you know, what, they've, what they've absorbed. So you can start to talk about ideas of fairness even with a toddler, um, is it, you know, just in very concrete ways. Is it fair, right? Um, is it fair that some people can afford to have something and some can't, you know, is, is certainly something. Although three, three year olds start starting to get the idea that things cost money and, you know, um, and playgrounds, you know, playgrounds in some schools or some neighborhoods are bigger and better than playgrounds in other places, right? Some kids get that. Now, kids, not everything is going to be, some kids may be like, what's great is to be out in the country where you can run around. And that may be a, a school that does not have a lot of money, a rural school, but they do have that green space. And so there are some things that, that are more important to kids than anything else, right? But, but you can talk about the concepts of fairness with the toddler is my point. And mm -hmm. when they get older, you can keep talking about fairness and you can say, you can use the same idea of the playgrounds with a four, five or six year old, right? But you can also ask them about their own experience. You can ask them about how they're treated. So if you're child is African-American, they are absolutely noticing how people treat them and forming conclusions, right? If your child is white, they may not be noticing that African-American kids might be treated differently, but they might be, right? And it just, they're, just to talk to them about their own observations, their own experiences is really important. Um, and if you're having a conversation, for instance, about what's happening right now in the news, you can say, uh, a police officer, it's, you can start with police officers, when they arrest someone, if somebody is being, um, if somebody is threatening that the police officer or someone else, the police officer is allowed to use force. In fact, deadly force. They are allowed to, if the person is threatening. But once somebody is in handcuffs, there's no, you know, there's no, it's actually illegal to use deadly force. Um, and sometimes the police are angry and they do it anyway. And not all police officers are like that. Many police officers here are taking the knee. You could discuss what taking the knee means and, and mm -hmm. showing solidarity with the protesters, the demonstrators. But sometimes police officers get angry just like everybody else, but they have a special responsibility because they have guns and handcuffs and their authority. So they have a special responsibility 
Does it ever, is it ever a good idea when you get mad at somebody to hurt them physically? You ask your preschooler, you know, and every five-year-old or four-year-old in the country will tell you, no, it's not allowed, but sometimes I feel like doing it or sometimes I do it. And that's the discussion. Use your words, right? This, they forgot to use, they got so mad, they forgot to use their words. Has that ever happened to you? Most people feel like that, but we work very hard to use our words. You can always say what you need and want without attacking the other person, you know? And I think that you put it in those terms, they begin to understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Does it, how does our languaging change then once, because by the time that, you know, our kids enter their tweens, right? The parental influences kind of change. They're getting a lot of peer influences now and the parental influences. Um, you know, I've sat down with my kids and, you know, they don't, they don't, they're in that individuation phase or 15 and 17 years old. They know everything. So there's, you know, you're, um, they know, they know where I stand, um, you know, and so I, you know, I, but I also want to make sure like they're hearing me to make sure that it's very clear if it wasn't clear before then that it's clear now, but then that tween phase though, between, you know, I know everything and I am still listening to everything mom and dad says is in that, that tween phase. And so how would, how would dialoguing through this actually look like, because I feel like, you know, for myself, um, with personal experiences, I have a lot of triggering and traumatizing events that go back to that time period because you're still very vulnerable as a child, you know, at that stage of, yes, um, you are, yep. you know, and then back in those years for, for me, um, you know, I'm 48 years old. Am I 48 years old? Yeah. I think that's, um, uh, yeah. So <laughs> obviously it's getting there. <laughs> um, but it was, hearing about, you know, Russia was evil and, you know, nuclear war was behind the corners. And they had those movies that I refused to watch when I was even a kid because I didn't want to watch a nuclear bomb go off and blow up, especially since the target was Kansas. And that's where I lived at that time. Um, so there's a lot of really strong traumas that can happen that we look like maybe we're doing better as a 12, you know, 11, 10, 11, 12 year old, but it's still, we're still very much kids inside, you know, being injured by this. So how does a parent parent through that? Because that does feel like a, 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 it's all dicey, but that feels like an, a different type of dicey. We may be thinking they're, a, they're behaving more adult-like, but not quite yet. Yeah. Um, 11, 12, 13, you're totally right that they may be starting to look like emerging adults, but it's very, it can be very traumatic and it can disturb their sleep and it can be very, it can create anxiety. So again, I think you want to um, do everything I've talked about so far, which is, you know, ask what they know, listen, ask their opinions. And you also want to reassure. Now, I didn't say this about talking with younger kids, but you always reassure. You always reassure that they are safe. And, uh, you know, I've had African-American families tell me, well, we can't really tell our kids that. And that's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth is we owe all children no matter who they are, we owe them the reassurance that they're safe and that we, the grownups, have got this and we're going to keep them safe. I think whether you're, whatever race your child is, we are telling our children that we, the grownups, are going to handle this. So when it's a young child, we've got this, you're safe. It's a little different by the time they get to 12 because they're out there without us with them sometimes and they could be mouthing off to a police officer. So you have to give them these warnings at the same time you know, that they're not always going to be safe if they're out there without us, right? At the same time that you want to reassure them, of course they're safe because you don't want them to be anxious, right? So I think that's the fine line you're walking where you want to say, you know, if a police officer, do you think police officers are always right? Honey, you say to your 12-year-old and your 12-year-old says, duh, no, right? Unless, unless they have a father or an uncle or a grandfather who's a cop, in which case they might say, well, most of the time, you know, they might, they might say that. Um, and you can say, you know, most police officers, and this is my actual belief, go into the business trying hard to serve and protect and, and do a good job. And many police officers would never do such a thing as we're seeing has just happened. But it's not the first time it's happened. There are many police officers who would and have done such things. And so they're definitely not always right. Here's the thing. If you're still alive, you can sue them later. <laughs> but you can't do that if you're dead. When a police officer tells you to do something, you do it. You do it. And then 
later on. If you're going to file a lawsuit, you file a lawsuit and maybe you win. But you don't, you don't try to litigate it with a man with a gun who thinks they're in, – in, who, who in fact – has the right at that moment. You don't have the right to resist arrest. You don't have the right, any right, when they're telling you what to do. So I think that's the kind of thing you absolutely are telling your tweens and teenagers because they could be in a position without you. And yet at the same time, you're saying to them, the odds of this happening to you are not, are, are small, you know, um, you are safe. I will do everything in my power to keep you safe. Um, and this is true even if you have a child who's of color. You're saying this to them, that I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you safe. But you're also teaching them ways that they can keep themselves safe. I guess that's what I would say. And you, again, you always, you know, you said, well, what about that in-between stage when they could be traumatized by hearing this? I would, you know, I don't like letting kids that age have unfettered access to social media and news because it's just too traumatic. I mean, it, you know, if you're not traumatized by watching some of the videos that have been released in the last week, again, you're not paying attention. You didn't see them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't want my 12-year-old watching those. If they were going to watch something and really insisted on it, but everybody else watched it and saw it and I want to see what it was, if you're, if, then I would do it with them. I w it's called co-viewing. Psychologists call this co-viewing, where you sit with your child while they're absorbing any kind of media and you help them interface with it. You help them ask critical questions. So you're increasing their media literacy. And you're, you're saying to them, um, okay, do we need to pause this, take a breath, right? Or this is excruciating, isn't it? Wow, okay, I'm afraid I'm gonna have, and, and you could even just pause and say, I don't want this in my mind. Do you really want this in your mind? Maybe we need to stop this, you can say. Um, and you can also ask, what do you think of what this person is doing? Is this the right thing to be doing? Um, what do you imagine he's thinking and feeling to be doing such a thing? Um, how could you stop that? You know, what would be our responsibility to stop it? Is there something you could do, right? So I think, I think all of, I think the co-viewing is maybe the answer if kids insist, but I would try to keep them away from stuff that's super traumatic when they're under the age of, say, 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. It's hard. And I, so for any parent that maybe wasn't able to do that or hasn't done that yet, um, you know, is there a way for, the, for dialing that back a little bit? You know, because you again, have a conversation, you know, yeah. at kids, when kids have been traumatized by something they see, and, you know, I'll give you a totally unrelated example that is very common. The average age, I don't know if it's average, the most, I think it is the most common age of exposure to pornography in the United States for boys is 10 years old, I believe. 10 years old, and since most pornography these days has an element of violence to it and an element of subjugating women, I've heard so many stories from parents of, of their, their boys who are tweens, you know, 10, 11, 12, who've been totally traumatized by some other kids showing them pornography and they saw violence that they can't get out of their heads and they're very upset about it and they feel like they're bad kids. So my answer is it's like any other trauma. They observed, or they witnessed something that was very traumatic. They need to have somebody help them through that, whether it's a parent or a therapist or someone. And I think if your child has been exposed to something traumatic um, in some other way, watching somebody be murdered on a video, right, by a police officer, um, I think that's pretty traumatic too. And, and they do need to talk with you about it. I wouldn't just gloss over it and hope they forget it because that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, kids internalize, you know, it's, it's internalized, right? And that's normal and natural. Um, and yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, again, that's how we learn, right? We learn by receiving it and then, you know, working it through in whatever ways. And, um, it, you know, I think about, again, how many parents themselves are in a state of trauma, you know, and again, that's why we started the conversation with is, you know, for parents to be able to regulate themselves and, and this sounds like another one of those things of being intentional and mindful of whether or not you're consuming this stuff because we are stuck at home, right? Where, you know, I've been cornered up in the off, you know, my office, air quotes, is my living room <laughs> and uh, the kids have been in their rooms. But I mean, it, this, this consumption of this stuff is happening inside of our own homes. Again, it's not safe outside on, on the streets and it's not safe inside the house, you know, speaking in, in um, generalities there. And um, I guess it would be another one of those things for really being mindful of like, um, if you feel like you need to be informed in what's going on in the world, be mindful of who's watching you, take that information in. 
Yes. And, and, and also to take a break yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it, during the height of the pandemic, do you really need to take the news in more than once a day? You're not, what are you going to learn? Stay home. Wear a mask when you go out. People are dying, right? What do, you, what do you actually need to learn? I'm not saying there aren't developments, but they don't happen. You don't need to take news in more than once a day. And that's true right now as well. Mm-hmm. It is true right now as well. So I would say if you can ratchet back your own news consumption, the research is really clear on this, you will be able to stay calmer. And if you're calmer, you can help your kids. And I would talk to kids about this. I would talk to kids about how when you, when you are, when there's a, a major thing that's upsetting, we want to get a handle on it. We want to try to manage it. And so we keep pursuing that news, trying to get the piece of information that will somehow make the difference and we'll understand or we'll feel better about it. or we'll, And it's not going to happen. That's mm-hmm. not going to happen. It's not the way it works. We cannot look to, you know, that's doom surfing. It's not going to get you somewhere where you're going to feel better. So the way to feel better is to actually check in once a day with the news, if that's what you want to do, and turn it off. Turn it off. There's no reason to be on it. And I would say the same thing goes actually for social media. Social media makes us, we know news makes us feel worse. We know news, people who regularly consume news are more um, negative about the world. They're more likely to be depressed and anxious and they're more pessimistic. I mean, I guess that's the same as more negative. We, we also know that people who are on social media are more anxious, more prone to depression, right? And I don't, I don't know whether they're more pessimistic or negative. I, I don't know that that's come up. But certainly if what you're looking, if you're looking at Twitter, you're, I mean, let me just say unequivocally, if you're looking at Twitter, my, my daughter is 24 and she was working as, when she first got out of college uh, last year, she was working um, as a publicist to help p- some people who are publishing their books, um, publish their books. So she was on Twitter all the time. She'd never been on Twitter before as, as a 24 year old because kids don't really like Twitter very much, at least mine didn't. Mm-hmm. So she said to me, Twitter brings out the worst in people. It's designed to do that. Why would anyone spend time on Twitter? It makes you a worse human being. I never, I don't want to be a publicist because I would never want to have to spend time on Twitter again for the rest of my life. You know, I thought, yeah, out of the mouths of babes, you know, she was exposed for six months and that was enough for the rest of her life. You know, there's no reason to subject ourselves to things that are going to make us feel worse. You're not getting something of value out of that. I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, looking at resiliency and how it's developed in people and how it can be trained and nurtured, that is definitely, you know, one of the facets of it. You describe this whole of like trying to figure out the who, what, when, where, and how, like, and, and being a, almost uh, obsessing over that because the answers are rarely ever there. They're rarely satisfying. Um, you know, you, it's a, it's an endless search for the fountain of youth, you know, sometimes and looking for the solution. And, that the next thing is the, you know, is being able to go from, um, is turn into positive actions. And, you know, and like I said, some people do get themselves right. And right now it's easy to see, it's easy to understand, it's easy to hold a light for people to see how they might be trapped into this mode of that if they release too soon, that the movement and the momentum will stop and slow if we shift our, you know, attentions and our mm-hmm. directions away mm-hmm. from it. But there, there is a way to go through constructively and say, well, no, we can keep moving this forward, but we can now start talking about, and so I think about like, you know, with kids, you know, one of the things that is important, a skill set that's important is, well, what should we do then? And, and having the, you know, a conversation with when that's age appropriate of like, well, what do you think could be different about what's going on right now? How could we change this and, and almost model for them and train them into understanding how to take positive actions forward, right? Absolutely. And I, I do think, you know, when you plant a garden, you don't just plant the seeds and walk away. You know, you <laughs> keep watering that garden. You keep the weeds going. You, so there, there are absolutely ways on an ongoing basis that we can take political action uh, about things that are important to us. And I would say, especially if your child is 12 or up, they could start to research what organizations are doing what they think of as 
positive, constructive work that they want to contribute to in some way as a volunteer or, I mean, I did political volunteering when I was a teenager. I think, you know, it's a great thing for kids to do and they learn a tremendous amount. So when they find an organization whose mission they admire, and I'm using political writ large, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, I worked on, you know, a political campaign when I was a teenager, a presidency campaign, but I also did, you know, work for a food bank. I mean, you can do all kinds of work that, that is political in nature, makes the world a better place. I guess I would say mission work, mm -hmm. um, mission, not missionary, but, you know, work, work yep. with a mission. No, understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think there are many things that you can do as a young person um, to, you know, what about a teaching, a virtual teaching, organizing a virtual teaching for your school in the fall, whether maybe it won't be virtual, maybe it'll be in person, but if it has to be virtual, that's okay. But what about writing right now while strike while the iron is hot, write to the people, the leadership at your school, either the student leadership or the principal and, and teachers or both. And why not put together a virtual teaching? This, I mean, that, that would be, be an amazing thing for a young person to do, that they would learn so much from that project, and, and so would everybody else in the school, right, as an example. Um, and I think there's also just a lot of self-education. I mean, if you're white in this culture, there's a lot of self-education that one really, that behooves us to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there are so many resources at this point to do that with. So I, I think we could encourage our kids, you know, it's not about, um, staying in a place of rage. It's about knuckling down and getting to work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with that. So how can people, like, do you have other resources? Your blog is timely. Um, you've been posting about like how to parent through the pandemic on there and, you know, what, you know, some do's and don'ts. Um, like I said, you uh, published your article this week, obviously timely to it about how to talk with your kids about racism. And you do go into more details than what we covered today on some of the conversations and a really good, there was a graphic included in there. I just want to let everybody know that actually shows kind of like the developmental and what those conversations may actually look like. Um, what other resources do you have your parents that you have for parents? Um, because as we said, kind of the, the big thing is, is our baseline is nowhere near normal right now. And since it's number one and paramount to create a sense of peace around our kids, even in an unpeaceful world, um, what do you have out there for some folks to, to be able to still resource right now? Well, so as I said, if you live with children, you get your buttons pushed all the time. You're getting triggered all the time. So my life's work is, is talking to parents about how to work on themselves. So I have three books out, Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings. My third one, my workbook, is really the whole, someone wrote to me and said, this is a self-help book disguised as a parenting book. And that's exactly what it is. It, it certainly has a lot that will help parents, um, you know, like to parent. But it is really a book for parents to work on themselves or for people to work on themselves. And there's also a lot just for free on my website. It's a thousand pages. So much of it is about parental self-care, self-compassion, self-work, self-management, self-regulation. It's, there's so much there. So I think if you spent any time on my website, um, you, you would see that and, and, um, you know, I, I have an online course for parents that I teach three times a year. So it won't be offered again until the fall, but it is specifically, I mean, it's, it's like a boot camp for parents, but like about how to connect with their kids, how to set limits effectively. But a lot of it and where it begins is self-regulation for parents. And there's a lot, there's, there's a whole section on working, working on your own triggers. There's a whole section on self-care for parents because you can't, it's 12 weeks, right? And so if you take the self-regulation, the self-care and the working on your, your own triggers, that's three of the 12 weeks just for the parent because that's the work that has to be done. We all have to do this work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Fantastic. I like talking to you. So smart. <laughs> and again, I really do appreciate you taking the time with me today to, uh, to talk about this um, in particular um, right now. And I, I'm hoping, you know, that this is something for the, the listeners out there that are uh, really, you know, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's hard. I, I said, even my chest is tightened. And, I, you know, I'll tell everybody, like, I, I go for walks or runs. Like, I definitely have had to do that. And the other day, it took me two hours 
to re-regulate myself. I was just like, I have to stop after the whole weekend of the protest and it just it reaching its fevered pitch. It was like, I can't do this anymore. Just put the phone away, put my music on and go. And yes. so it is, it is intention. I do agree. Like it's, and if you haven't made time for yourself before, it's more like more so now. Um, and I appreciate you saying 15 minutes is enough. And I, I do believe that it, it, it can be enough. Um, having conversations, if you have a co-parent or a spouse to make sure that you each get mm -hmm. something in there, I think it's going to be really important. Um, more so now with, you know, us being as triggered and with our kids and with so much that is going on in the world. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, I want to resonate something that you've also said, uh, taking time for yourself does not mean you don't care about what's going on in the world. Yes. Yeah. So uh, don't feel shame or guilt that you are taking some time for yourself. Holding a light for other people doesn't mean you don't care about what's going on in the world and that you're trying to Pollyanna a problem out there. You're simply holding a light for somebody um, and for yourself, quite honestly. Sometimes I find that when we are a light barrier, about 50% of it's for me, 50% <laughs> is for other people, to be honest, right? Like there's yes, a- Yes, totally. Yeah. Yes. Um, so anyways. The focus. if you're focusing on light, you're going to be feeling it yourself as well as supporting other people with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, it would be nice to think that this all gets tied up in a nice bow and this is all done. We've solved all the world's problems, but um, here in the United States, it is only June that we're talking about this. This is in 2020. There is a presidential election coming down the pipeline here. I've called it act three in this drama that we're living in called 2020. Um, do you have any particular advice knowing that regardless of what side of the political coin you live on, this isn't going to be an easy election. Someone's going to lose and someone's going to win. And there's going to be an awful lot of very unhappy people that, that this is a crescendo that we've been building to a climax in our country. I, I truly believe. Um, what can some parents begin to do now in, in preparation, knowing that this tsunami Again, it, and it, it's not going to be easy. So anybody thinks that maybe, maybe it won't be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal. How do we get ourselves ready knowing that we're ahead of this as opposed to us being surprised like we've all been surprised, you know, in the last, you know, six months? <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we would not be surprised by life? Well, right. I wouldn't necessarily. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would say two things. First of all, practice now your own self-regulation. That's going to help you get through the rest of this year. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is begin to talk with your children about the larger issues at stake. In a democracy, how do we make decisions, right? What's, what's the best way to make decisions? Why do we not have one person, one vote? Why do we have an electoral college? Very interesting if they wanted to research why we have an electoral college, right? Why, in fact, why does the Senate, ex it, you know, the House is completely based on how many people, right, are in a vicinity and therefore they elect X number of representatives, right? That's not true for the Senate. It's two per state. But there are some states with lots of people and some, and they're huge, you know, California. And then there's Connecticut that's tiny, like with just a few people by comparison. Like they really have the same number of senators. Why would, why would that decision have been made? Interestingly enough, it was made because of slavery. I'm not going to go into, I'm not a historian. I'm not going to go into any more detail right now, but anyone could Google that and find that out, right? Fascinating discussion to have with your kids. Why we have set up our democracy to not actually be fair, right? So that's interesting. We live in a divided country. It's true. But in fact, we often have people who win the popular vote who don't end up in the White House. And is that fair? I would have those kinds of discussions and say, how do we, if we think something's not fair in our democracy, in our attempt at democracy together, this experiment in democracy that is the United States, if we think it's not fair, how do we address that? What are, what are constructive ways to address that? People get angry, they do all kinds of things, but what's the most constructive way, right? And don't we get tired of having to be constructive all the time, but what other options are there, right? And why, do, why is it such a divided country? Has it always been? Maybe. That's that no one. I mean, I don't know that there is anyone who could actually say yes or no on that. But I would say that that people who grew up African American had a very different idea about the country in 1940 or 1960 or 1920. You know, so I'm talking about history. Um, than somebody who grew up white, probably right. So maybe it was always divided in that way. But 
what is making it so divided in people's idea, what people's perspective now? Why are their opinions so different? Oh, well, media. So media is a very interesting thing. Well, I talked about media literacy, literacy. We need to teach our kids that media always shapes opinion. And that when people hear on their favorite media something, they assume it's true and it may not be true. How can media get away with saying things that aren't true? Well, who's policing that? How could you find out if something's actually a fact or not? How, you know, the, I mean, children need to learn this stuff. This is basic media literacy to how do you know when something's a fact? What is a source that you can trust, right? And, you know, the people who have certain opinions, um, you know, if you, if you look at why they formed that opinion, it's because they absorbed media that told them certain things and they drew their conclusions from that. So, huh, well, we certainly believe in freedom, freedom of the press in the United States. That's a basic right. And yet at the same time, does that mean you're allowed to say anything you want even when it's not true? These are such important questions to talk about. I would say at the dinner table with your kids, ask questions. Let, you know, my daughter, I mentioned my 24 year old, she said to me, you know, when I was little, you would ask me questions. Like we went to the playground and you would say, why do you think that boy is crying? I said, oh, I was trying to develop empathy in you. I said to her, she said, oh, that's interesting. It might've worked, but I thought you cared about what I thought. And it gave me confidence so that my whole life at school, I knew I had important opinions because someone was listening. So, you know, it's good for kids' development to have these discussions and it, emotionally, and it's good for their development intellectually. And it's good for all of us as we're heading toward the election to, to, to pull back the camera to the larger experiment that, I mean, the largest experiment that human beings are involved in, as far as I'm concerned, is how do we learn that we're all in the same family, even when we look different, right? That someone who's a climate refugee from some other country who ends up in my town who looks really different than me is actually my family, right? We are all the same family, but how do we learn that? That's not something that we're... Um, that we think humans biologically evolved to think, but I think it's the next step of our evolution. So how do we all do that together? That's the biggest picture. And then the democracy picture for the United States, right? I mean, there's so many, and then there's the media picture. You know, there's so many questions that we as humans need to solve. And I wouldn't want to make young children anxious by making it sound like, yeah, it's just such a mess out here. You know, I, I want them to think adults have got this. I want them to, to know that there are smart people thinking about these things, talking about these things, and that there's a role for them to play too. There are all, humans are capable of evil, it's true, great evil, but humans are also capable of great good and sacrifice on behalf of others, even others they don't know who don't look like them. We can, we can point to many examples. And so the, the, the famous Fred Rogers line, look for the helpers. That's what it is that in any challenge. There will always be somebody who puts themselves on the line and endangers themselves on behalf of other people. There's always going to be helpers. And children need to know that. Young people of all ages from 2 to 20 need to know that because they need to see, A, that adults have got this, that there are some adults who have got this and are being the helpers, but B, that there's an option for that child. They don't have to be a victim and they don't have to be a perpetrator they can be a helper. We can all be helpers in our own way to make the world a better place and to solve some of the many problems. Listen, some of those problems got solved. Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine. That's no longer a problem for us. <laughs> We've got other problems, right? We have other problems. You, you, who, you know, if you're listening to this and you have a child, your child can be part of the solution to one of the many problems facing humans. And what a wonderful contribution we, all of our children and all of us can make it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful.